In this video, we're going to begin our discussion of Newton's laws of motion. Specifically, we'll be talking about Newton's first law, which is also referred to as the law of inertia. Let's start out with a conceptual question to help us understand where the law of inertia comes from. A rock is attached to a string and is swung in a circular path in a horizontal plane as illustrated below. If the rock is moving counterclockwise, what path would it follow if the string breaks? So of course you could do this yourself. Go find a rock or a ball tied to a string and swing it around your head. What is the ball going to do if you let go of the string or if the string breaks? That's the question. Well, you can imagine that it might do some different things. Maybe you think that it would keep curving, just not as much. Maybe you think it would go straight. Or maybe it would go off in some other direction, maybe even straight out. Well, it turns out that the correct path, what the ball actually does, is this one. It goes straight out, tangent to the circle that it was going in. And if we think about why that is, as we'll see, Newton's first law tells us that if there's not a force acting on an object, that object wants to go in a straight line. And so when that string breaks, the ball wants to just go in the direction it was going at that instant, and so it's going to go off in a direction tangent to the circle. So let's meet Newton's first law. Every object continues in a state of rest or with constant velocity unless acted on by a non-zero net force. The first thing we want to do here is make sure we understand what we mean by a net force. This is a very important point. A net force simply means the sum of all the forces acting. Now force is a vector. And we know that's true because if you push on something, it not only matters how hard you push, but in what direction you push. So force is clearly a vector. Therefore, when we use the term net force, what we mean is the vector sum of all, it's got to be all of them, all forces acting on the object. If we want to figure out what the net force is on an object, we have to identify all the forces acting and then do a vector sum. And of course, we covered how to add vectors in an earlier video. Let's talk about what we mean by the word inertia. The tendency of an object to maintain its state of rest or constant motion is called inertia. Now, you probably have a sense of what kinds of objects have a lot of inertia versus a little bit of inertia. For example, if I pushed a skateboard at you, you could easily stop that skateboard. But what if a big truck was rolling towards you? Well, that wouldn't be so easy to stop. So objects that have inertia have mass. And the more mass an object has, the more inertia it has. So mass is how we measure inertia. Picture that big truck. It's hard to get it to move. So it has inertia. It's hard to change its state of motion. But once it's moving, in this, by the same token, it's hard to stop it. Something that doesn't have much mass, it's easy to get it moving. It's easy to stop it. Let's look at a conceptual question. An airplane is flying at a height of 30,000 feet at 550 miles per hour directly toward Los Angeles. The force from the engines is 20,000 newtons, and the weight of the plane is 10,000 newtons. What is the net force on the plane? Go ahead and uh, pause the video and see if you can figure this out. Okay, what'd you get? Well, my guess is that you might have done a calculation with some of those numbers that I gave you. But in fact, there was no calculation to do. The net force is zero. How do I know that? Well, let's go back to Newton's first law again. We said that an object either continues at rest, in other words, not moving, or moving with constant velocity unless there is a non-zero net force. 
So let's write Newton's first law in another way. We could say if v is constant or v equals 0, which is obviously just a special case of being constant, then f net, and this is how we write the net force, f subscript net, equals 0. Right? That's the other way to say it. If it's moving with constant velocity or if the object is not moving at all, then we know the net force is equal to 0. Well, let's return to this problem and see how we can apply that. The key thing about this problem is I'm telling you that the object is moving with a constant velocity. In other words, I tell you it's flying at a specific height, at a specific speed, in a specific direction. So from that, we can see that the plane is moving with a constant velocity. Well, as we've just said, if the velocity is either constant or zero, the net force on the object has to be zero. And that's how we know the correct answer is D. Now, just because the net force is zero, it doesn't mean there aren't forces acting. Let's draw what we call a free body diagram. A free body diagram is a diagram that we draw to illustrate all of the forces acting on an object. We use a dot to represent the object, so that's the airplane. And we want to identify what forces are acting on the airplane. Can you think about what forces are acting? Well, the most obvious one is gravity, right? We know that the force of gravity is acting down on the plane. Another force is the force that the engines are exerting to push the plane forward. We call that the thrust. We also have air resistance. So the air resistance is trying to hold the plane back, and we usually refer to that as the drag. So that's simply the air resistance. Then finally, there's got to be an additional force, otherwise our plane would be going down, and that is lift. Lift is provided by the shape of the wings of an airplane. And uh, not to get into this in, in too deeply, but here's what the cross section of a wing looks like. Uh, it's curved and the top is a longer surface than the bottom, which is usually pretty flat. What happens is when air encounters the front end of the wing, the air that goes over the top of the wing has to travel a greater distance than the air that goes over the bottom of the wing. And it turns out that that makes an area of lower pressure up here. Pressure is just force per area and higher pressure down here. And that's what provides the lift of the airplane. Okay, so the key thing to take away from this problem is that if an object is moving with a constant velocity, we know the net force has to be equal to zero. Therefore, if we look at our free body diagram, we can see that when the plane is moving with a constant velocity, the thrust and the drag cancel each other out in the horizontal direction, and the lift and the force of gravity cancel each other out in the vertical direction. Now, obviously, if you want your plane to speed up or go up or go down, then we need an imbalance of forces. And that's really all what Newton's second law is all about. Let's take a look at another practical example of the law of inertia. And that is why seat belts are a good idea in a car. Let's say that you're driving along in your car and you don't have your seat belt on. And it's late at night and you don't notice that there is a brick wall in the middle of the road. Hopefully that will never happen to you, but pretend it's something like a big tree falls down. You don't see it or you see it at the last second. Well, what's going to happen? Your car experiences a force on it as it runs into the wall. But if you're not connected to your car with seat belts, then if your car was moving along, let's say at 30 miles per hour, and the car all of a sudden gets stopped, well, there's nothing to stop you because you're not connected to the car. 
you come out the windshield. And that's not what you want to have happen. That used to happen quite a bit before seat belts. Anytime you have a front end collision, if you're not belted into the car, you want to keep moving because of your inertia and the car experiences a force and comes to a stop. Now, as long as you have a seat belt on, then the force that the wall exerts on the car also gets transferred to you and, and keeps you in place. So you stay with the car. Another example of Newton's first law is why we need headrests in cars. And I want to concentrate on the uh, specific case of what happens in a rear end collision. It turns out that it's not too many years ago that cars didn't have headrests. So here's an example. I've got my driver, no headrest. And they're getting rear ended by this car. So think about what happens as this car pushes into the car in front of it. Well, the seat is connected to the car. So the seat gets pushed forward along with the car. The seat pushes your body forward, but if there's nothing here to push your head forward, everything moves forward except your head. And so what you would experience is your head snapping back. It's really not that your head snaps back, it's that the rest of you goes forward. And obviously that resulted in many serious neck injuries. But if we have the headrest here, then your head gets pushed forward along with the rest of your body if you're hit from behind. Obviously, a secondary point of a headrest is in a front end collision. Once you bounce forward off the seat belt or the airbag and you bounce back, it keeps your head from snapping back over the seat. Here's another example of the law of inertia. What happened here? Well, you can probably guess the truck had to stop quickly. It was carrying a large stone in it for its payload. And of course, the, own, the stone wasn't strapped down. So when the truck stopped abruptly, the stone kept moving. Fortunately, the driver was not hurt in this, but you can imagine that was a pretty tight squeeze in there in the cab. Let's look at this question. If you were floating in space where there is no gravity, and you were given two closed boxes which couldn't be opened, one filled with lead and one filled with feathers. Could you tell which was which? So think about that for a moment, and if you think the answer is yes, how would you tell? Well, it turns out the answer is yes, you can tell, but obviously you can't tell in the way we would normally tell. So when we're standing here on Earth, if I simply took the box with lead in it and gave it to you in one hand and I gave you the box with the feathers in them on the other hand it'd be very easy to tell which one was heavier um, because obviously the lead is much heavier than the feathers but if we don't have gravity pulling down on the objects so here we are now in space and we're trying to do the same thing what could we do well, the answer is we'd want to just use what we've learned from the law of inertia. We know that an object that has more mass is harder to get moving, and it's also harder to stop once it's moving. So literally, if you just tried to shake each box, you would find that you could shake the box with feathers in it very easily. But if you tried to shake the box with lead, it would be much harder to get it moving, and once you got it moving, it would be much harder to stop. So we've said that mass is the way that we measure how much inertia an object has. We want to make sure we can differentiate correctly between what we mean by mass and what we mean by weight. Well, you've all had other science courses and you've probably heard this definition of mass before. Mass is the amount of matter in an object. Okay, so it's how much stuff is in the object. Now specifically, what do we really mean by that? We literally mean the number of atoms and the type of atoms that make up the object. So if we've got an object that's made of lead atoms, that's gonna have a lot of mass because 
individual lead at atoms are relatively heavy compared to something like a hydrogen atom. So it's how much stuff the object is made of. That's what we mean by mass. What is weight? Well, in everyday speech, we often use these words interchangeably, but they don't mean the same thing. Weight is the gravitational force on an object's mass. So weight is a shorthand for the force of gravity. Now, mass and weight are directly proportional here on Earth. If I have, if I have one kilogram, that has a certain weight to it. If I have two kilograms, it will have twice as much weight. And so that's why when we set up scales on Earth, we can mark them in grams or kilograms when really what we're doing is we're measuring the force of gravity because they are directly proportional to each other. Try this question. The force of gravity on the moon is one-sixth as strong as the force of gravity on the Earth. If a six kilogram object is brought to the moon, what will its mass be there? Okay, well hopefully you got this one right. The correct answer is six kilograms. Here we have to be careful about identifying what we were given. This again is why I keep stressing that idea of making sure you understand the quantity the symbol and the unit of everything we look at. Notice I don't tell you what I'm giving you here. You have to know that I'm giving you mass because mass has units of kilograms. Okay, So if I give you the mass of the object, well the mass of an object just depends on what the object is made of. If you now take that object and bring it to the moon, it didn't change the object. So it still has a mass of six kilograms. However, the weight of the object or the force of gravity acting on the object would change. And as we'll see, the for forces, the unit is the Newton. Okay, so the force of gravity would be different on that object, but the mass of the object does not change as we move it around the universe. Next time we'll move on and look at Newton's second law of motion.